Dr. Scott Atron has traveled the world interviewing and in some cases living among known terrorists in order to better understand the motivations of those who kill in the name of God. He published his findings in a book titled Talking to the Enemy, Faith, Brotherhood, and the Unmaking of Terrorists. Atron is taught at Cambridge University, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and the École des Hautes Etudes in Paris. He is a research director in anthropology at the French National Center for Scientific Research and a visiting professor in psychology and public policy at the University of Michigan. Dr. Atron was the keynote speaker for the inaugural Abelson Religious Reconciliation Lecture that was held on February 4th at the University of Science and Arts. Earlier in the day, we captured this conversation between Atron and Dr. Zach Simpson, Assistant Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies, who occupies the university's Abelson Religious Reconciliation Chair. We're going to send our best ping pong teams, which are pretty crappy, by the way, <laughs> to China, and they're going to get their asses beat. And the Chinese, who their big thing is the lack of respect. They're feeling that people have not respected them for the great people they were. They're going to beat us every time. And that's exactly what happened. And I talked to many Chinese leaders from the time. Headlines of all the Chinese papers, TV, radio, filled with the defeat of the Americans. And the Americans accepted their defeat gracefully, mm -hmm. acknowledged that they were inferior in ping pong to the Chinese. <laughs> I mean, we laugh about it now, but this was a strategic breakthrough. After the last ping pong match, Chow and Lai invited Henry Kissinger, and within two months, Richard Nixon was in Beijing, and the, cold, the, the shape of the Cold War had changed. What had we done? We had leveraged something of trivial value to us through the value system of the Chinese into a great, I think, into a great intellectual uh, uh, breakthrough in the Cold War. And that meant, uh, I think, potentially could have saved hundreds of millions of lives. So, so it, it seems like a lot of these seemingly intractable conflicts then not necessarily could always be resolved, but could be softened by um, making these non-material trade-offs in terms of, um, uh, I don't know what the equivalent of ping-pong diplomacy would be in, in say, um, Israel and Palestine, but it seems like those kinds of, those trade-offs are in some sense easier to make, but also in yet another sense much more difficult to make. Well, I'll give you an example. So I asked Mr. Netanyahu, we were going to Damascus to see the leaders of the Hamas, Mr. Michel, and I asked uh, Mr. Netanyahu, what there's no communication with these groups, of course. Uh, what, what, he, what he wanted to ask him. And he said, there's only one thing that interests me. I don't care about borders, negotiations. Will the Hamas ever recognize the right of the Jewish people to be here, to have their own country? And I also asked him, so what would make you make peace with them beyond just the recognition? And he said, when I see every anti-Semitic reference expunged from their textbooks. Then I believe it. So I went to, to Damascus. And I asked Khalid Mishal, the head of the Hamas, what he thought about that. And he said, hmm, our people have been in jail for over 60 years. You want us to recognize our jailer, the rights of him to be here? Let us out of prison and we'll talk. Then I asked him, and what would you ask of the Israelis? And he said, I have one question for them. Will they ever recognize and apologize for the harm they did to our people in 1948 and continue to do to our people? And when we do experiments with these people, that is, we do not only talks with the leaders, but we do massive experiments with the population, survey experiments, we find that for core values like the right of return of Palestinian refugees to Israel or the right of Israel to Jerusalem, we find that people aren't willing to give up those values. The more money you offer them to give up those values or the more sanctions, as we are doing with the Iranians, the more they're likely to get angry, to resort to violence, which goes quite against rational choice theory and standard right. political theory. But if you recognize their values, with no material compensation whatsoever, apologies, which is why a divorce lawyer will tell you, <laughs> never, never apologize, apologize yeah. because we'll be out of a job. <laughs> but just things like apologies and shows of respect, as Chinese leaders tell us, and which is true, can make a great difference. And we find even the most hardcore militants on both sides 
much more willing to engage in negotiation if those values, like recognition of our right to exist or apologize for what you did to us, if those are sincere. If they're insincere, like the Japanese apologizing for war crimes and then going visit, visit uh, war crime shrines, <laughs> then it has the opposite effect, of course. Then it can lead to disastrous collapse of relations between them. So it has to be sincere. And getting the sincerity in it, that's the hard part.